All right, so welcome everybody. This is another edition of our Tarleton Online Community College Leadership Series. Today, I am joined by none other than Dr. Mordecai Brownlee. He is the president of Community College of Aurora in Colorado. We're so happy to have you here today. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Dr. Edwards. I've been really looking forward to this conversation, my friend. Awesome, me too. All right, so let's start off. Tell, me, tell us a little bit about your institution there. Yeah, so uh, we're here in Aurora, Colorado. We're 39 years young. We're the youngest uh, community college in the uh, state of Colorado. Uh, and we can talk a bit more about that history. Uh, but we take great pride in what we do. We have a campus uh, here in Aurora. We have a campus uh, in Denver as well. Our Colorado Film School uh, is there in Denver. Uh, and uh, we have roughly about 10,788 students that we serve. Uh, this includes online. This includes in-seat. This includes hybrid. Um, and I will say that we also have a strong presence with English second language. That's a mm. strong part of what we do uh, as we think about the histories of Aurora. For those that don't know, historically speaking, Aurora was where people of color were able to settle throughout the years. While they may have served in Denver, they could not afford to live in Denver. And so Aurora really became that hub. For that reason, we are truly the most diverse, racially diverse college here in the state of Colorado. Uh, roughly 67, 68% of our students are students of color. 52% uh, of our students are first generation. Um, and roughly 51% are Pell recipients. Uh, and uh, we have a strong concurrent uh, enrollment model as well. That word is used a bit differently than it is in Texas. I think we'll talk about that uh, here in a little bit. Uh, but uh, we have a strong concurrent enrollment population. And uh, we do some exciting work. Uh, we're here really focused in on social and economic mobility, employment, mm. uh, taking a look at what we're doing to really move the needle for our students. A lot of them working uh, households, uh, single parents, uh, and those that are seeking to truly realize their dreams. And I'm just honored to be able to be in this role and uh, be a part of this good work, my friend. Thank you for that. It's important. I think, you know, a lot of times we think about college as, you know, it's a certain kind of student who has a certain kind of income and certain uh, pedigree and comes and goes to stay in a residential environment for four years. And when you look at who the average college student is, it's who you just described. I mean, it's this community college is where you're going to see what the average college student is today. So thank you for that. Absolutely. All right. So tell me about your role as president. Man, I'm telling you, it's the best job in the world uh, because, you know, as a dedicated educator, it's essentially creating the environment for other educators to be able to fulfill their lives purpose their life's purpose work um, and all of us be centered around the mission um, which here our mission is to serve a diverse student population uh, and in providing them our students with uh, high quality instruction and support services towards transferability and employment mm -hmm. around a large, much larger vision which that vision is to uh, be the college where every student can succeed. And so it is my role as president then to create that environment, uh, ensure the preparedness and supports of our educators doing this work and ensure essentially at the end of the day that the mission is being fulfilled. And I love doing this work. Awesome, that's that's just, I mean, you encapsulate so many things in that, that I mean, I could really t take an hour and unpack what you just said, <laughs> but uh, we'll try to do it by question by question. Uh, so tell me about your path to the presidency and how it maybe it is similar or different than what you've seen uh, from others. Oh, my goodness, let me tell you, my path to the presidency started with me failing developmental math. OK, so um, <laughs> I raised by a single mother who was an educator um, and and, uh, you know, went through, originally from Toledo, Ohio. We moved around a whole lot. I had a very determined mother who was going to find opportunities to make sure that we made it. Uh, we eventually settled, settled in uh, Humble, Texas, Humble, Texas, which is north of Houston. Uh, and right around that time, I was making some decisions, uh, finishing up high school, decided to stay local, decided to work as well. I'm one of those students that worked the entirety of my college career um, and uh, tested at developmental levels. And so I had to go through this whole understanding of, well, how is it that I've got a high school diploma, but I'm not college ready? What does that mean? Uh, and uh, took developmental math, failed it, uh, really was discouraged, uh, Dr. Edwards. And what I decided to do at that point in time is I went to work overnight. I started working at uh, near Houston Intercontinental Airport, Bush Intercontinental Airport. Uh, and I was uh, helping to break down the planes that had product, mail product on it, and uh, was resorting it out for distribution. 
And I had a temporary job and I remember them saying, hey, this is a temporary job, you all can't stay. And thinking about what am I going to do from an employment standpoint, someone saying, hey, if you go back up there to that college, you can qualify for what's called work study. Fast forward, became a work study student. And that's where the light bulb happened for me uh, because I began to receive mentorship that I had never received. People truly began to take a liking, a true care for who I was, uh, 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 who I am as an individual and at that particular time. And uh, the rules were a bit different then, man. You, as long as you didn't go over 20 hours, you can do any, many jobs around the college that you wanted to. So I was flipping burgers over at the cafeteria. I was running lights and sound at the theater. I was, uh, this is back when they had the tube televisions and the VHSs. I was rolling that in for media day uh, for teachers in the classroom um, and really began to get into uh, recreational sports pretty heavy. Uh, and that's where that first light bulb went off of, hold on, you can make a living doing like, this, this is a job like this. This is a this. You could do this. Um, and from there, man, I remember that light bulb going off. I began to understand my learning style, study, study habits, taking on the right habits. I should mentorship, as I spoke about earlier. And I remember graduating, man, and uh, being there in that student center and really asking someone at the, around the table, you know, what's the job that creates this magic for somebody else? And they said being a president. I says, OK, well, that's what I'm going to be. And I think from there on, my friend, that became my pathway to say, what does that look like? From there, moved on to my four-year institution, I got really heavily involved with residential life. So residential life became my pathway that took me into judicial affairs, uh, from judicial affairs, making my way in academic advising and uh, early alert coordination was really big during that time, was just really rolling out. Um, and then uh, Hurricane Ike and Katrina hit. Um, and the institution I was working at at that particular time really took a big hit. We lost, uh, in terms of operations, about five buildings in one night. Um, and that also meant from a budgetary standpoint, we had a strong impact as well. So the reduction in workforce at that given time meant that I had to take on more duties to make myself useful. Uh, and that's exactly what I did. So I took over the learning center in terms of leadership, uh, uh, began to lead uh, um, uh, disability services, testing services, um, and, and really got engaged. From there, we were able to climb out of that point of crisis. And then I moved into director of student life at another institution, which took me into student union management, which then took me into my dean of students role. Uh, from there, made the jump into senior student affairs role. And at that point, uh, I started teaching uh, out of the School of Business uh, and Leadership and enjoyed doing that. From there, took me to San Antonio, where I served as vice president of student success at St. Philip's College, uh, the nation's only historical black college, Hispanic serving institution, that's a community college under the leadership of Dr. Adina Williams Lawson. And uh, from there, here into the presidency. So it's been, it's, it's been beautiful. Um, it's been a, a, a fast paced journey, but it's a journey that really had me concentrate deeply on impact and the transformation of students' lives uh, to make sure that that magic happened. And every day I mentally go back to that lunch table that I was at to ask, what does it take to make this happen for others? And that's what I show up to do every day. Well, I, you know, I, I'm really amazed by how you you draw upon your own experiences at that level to the, the work that you do every day, you know, and, and you talk about, you know, failing developmental math. And I mean, the reality is for a lot of our students, that is where they get hung up, you know, yes. and uh, so you, you've been there and you know, what it has taken you to get over that hurdle and is helps you to think about what are the supports that students need in order to, to do that. Uh, and so I think that is really powerful in how that guides you. I think also, I think it's really powerful how you led through, you know, you, there's this expression about how crisis creates opportunity, you know, so, yes. you know, I did what it did, but it actually created opportunities for you to lead and serve in new ways. Mm -hmm. uh, and you took advantage of that. And it wasn't so much about promoting yourself as much as it was about how do you increase your impact, as you said. That's right. Um, and then you also figured out, okay, beginning with the end in mind, if, if you want to be a college president, what are the variety of experiences that I need in order to effectively manage the entire campus? Uh, because if you're a college president, you know, you're going to be over all of these different departments. So you know, you had some teaching experience, you had some student affairs experience, you know, you had some advising experience, all of these things fit together uh, in terms of creating that whole experience. 
Oh, I think I lost your audio there, Dr. Evans. No, I'm here. Yeah, I'm, I'm here just, uh, I, 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 I guess for me, that's just, it's powerful that you were able to piece together all of those things. And so, uh, you know, I, I think that that's really important. I think sometimes there's this, uh, and it kind of, you know, there's this, this view sometimes that people who are presidents come from a particular route. Mm -hmm. And I think what we're seeing today, when you look around at a lot of the new presidents that are being hired, uh, they, a lot of them are coming from a variety of backgrounds, both the two-year and the four-year level. And I think there's some value in that. Absolutely. It is the diversity of experiences, as well as the, the, the diversity of identities right. that really allow for this work to be advanced um, in this new era of, of society. Uh, and, and, it, and it requires that. It requires different lenses. It, it requires different experiences. Um, I truly believe as, you know, as we study just the history of community colleges, let alone higher education, there truly was a quote unquote a breed of individual that were put into these, these positions um, and, and these various pathways. And that's just not the reality anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really about impact, um, more than passion, impact. Passion, impact, um, uh, and a strategic focus on how do we ensure the relevance and the advancement of societies in our respective spaces. And I think also for leaders, um, you know, I think it creates opportunities for new perspectives and new voices um, in the room when it comes to leadership, uh, because, you know, we know that, you know, when you only look at one path, you tend to only get one perspective. And in the reality is sometimes experiences are very unique in that role. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you only have people with one set of experience, you don't always make the best decisions. Uh, and so getting people with a breadth of experience, uh, you know, and I, I guess I, I sort of liken that to sometimes some of the things that we see in coaching where, you know, there was this thought in football that you had to be an offensive coordinator in order to be an effective, you know, head coach in football. Coach. That's and right. now yeah. they're saying, no, maybe you can be a defensive coach and be a good coach. And, and that one decision has then created opportunities for all sorts of people who couldn't have been head coaches before to now be head coaches. Uh, and so I think that's really powerful. Yes. Yes. Thank you, my friend. No problem. Um, now, from here, what I would like to ask you and it's kind of special to your experience. Uh, what are aspiring college presidents or community college presidents in particular need to know about student engagement and student success since you've had some experience there? Yes. From a student engagement standpoint, it goes back to the word relevance. Uh, from an engagement standpoint, um, a, a bit of what we've done previously may not work in this next iteration. Um, I think a part of what we've learned in terms of communications, uh, student interest, uh, how we create community has shifted over time. Uh, it still is very important. And I think the question really becomes is how do we create relevant spaces of community? How do we create spaces uh, for educating students on what these various pathways are and what it means to their family? Because i.e. I don't see that job on TikTok, so I do not know necessarily about that opportunity. Right. And so what, what is happening is just a shifting of communications, a shifting of exposures. So students are able now more than ever to obtain information outside of their nucleus of their community, um, their immediate communities that could be mom, dad, that can be, you know, whatever their living situation is. Because in so many cases, our students were victim in some cases to only what they were exposed to in the household. And so now there are means to obtain additional information However, that information in many cases still leaves a strong level of ignorance into understanding what does this mean for me? What does success look mm -hmm. like for me? Um, and so the student engagement piece is critical because as we talk about productive citizenship, as we talk about um, economic mobility uh, and students having the ability, number one, to dream and then having the pathway infrastructure laid out for how do I get to this dream? Um, is now more critical and crucial than ever. Now, in terms of student success, I think that that engagement feeds into the student success. The success in itself truly starts with the infrastructure, the end in mind. And I think that this is also where the evolution must occur. Um, I, I believe, me personally, this is with my, my personal lens and experiences, that I'm finding that across the nation, we have a plethora of broken processes. Mm -hmm. 
students are experiencing that are preventing them from even properly onboarding at the institutions, let alone experience success at the institutions. Um, and, and so as we talk about even here at TCA, 52% uh, of our students being first generation students, we're having some very, very, very um, uh, uh, deep conversations uh, and having to make some pivots about our onboarding experiences. Um, you, you're, you're talking first generation families where any question asked at any given time may serve as a barrier, right. uh, where a process that works for us does not work for them. Uh, and, and so what does that mean then for us to increase our conversion rate of the applicant uh, into the actual classroom and helping them to understand and dream and set themselves on a proper pathway while creating a community towards engagement, ultimately towards completion. And so it is truly a revolution and evolution of sorts that I will say for anyone that's watching this, listening to this, that now more than ever, we really have to break down the student experience, the supply chain if you will, from a business perspective of these student experiences uh, and applicant experiences and, and, and really ask ourselves, where do we remove the barriers? Where do we increase access? Where do we increase student success? Uh, and, and, and let's just create the right experience that ensures success. Yeah, it makes so so much sense. I mean, my, my background in higher ed administration has mostly been in enrollment management. And so okay. when we think about the enrollment funnel, you know, students, you know, expressing interest in the institution all the way to, to graduation and beyond. And, you know, at every level, there are some some checkpoints. And, you know, we find that sometimes we lose students at all those various checkpoints. And, you know, it's easy to sometimes say, well, that student didn't do what they were supposed to do. Wow. Um, but I, I know Tarrant County College in Fort Worth, they have this expression that they're talking about being a student ready college, because I know a lot of times when we talk about getting college ready students, mm -hmm. it, but we sometimes need to flip it around on ourselves and say, how do we, how do we become ready for these students as they are, you know, and get them to where they need to go. Um, if they were already ready, they wouldn't need us, right? You know, that we're, we're here to help them get ready for whatever the next thing is, whether it's employment or whether it's, you know, going on to a four year. Um, but I think your perspective in terms of like, you know, you talked about the supply chain, I, you know, I think a lot about, you know, flow charts and okay, where, where, where are we, where are we, are we, where are we in this process? Are we losing the most students and what are we doing that's causing that? Or what can we do to fix that? Uh, because I do, I think most of us who are in education long enough have a little bit of agency and we feel like we have a little bit of ownership over the outcome, you know, like it's, yeah. if there's an outcome, we can make it better. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we don't just kind of pawn it off and say, eh, they weren't ready, they didn't do what they're supposed to do. Um, and so we, we, you know, we put ourselves in these positions to try to create change. And so I think that's, that's a really powerful perspective that you have. Um, I think, you know, where we're going, you know, in terms of the expectations on college, you know, because we're seeing so much lately about the value of college and are we are we putting forth you know what people want for their money um, and i do think there are a lot of people who look at college as a big organization and they're thinking well you know uh if if we, we go to walmart or target and expect that organization to run smoothly and properly and have good processes wouldn't we also expect that for our colleges and universities and i think that we're now getting that placed upon us and i think that to a certain extent, I think it's fair. Uh, and I, I think it's probably only going to grow. Uh, mm -hmm. But I do think being particularly at the community college level, you're at such a point to be able to quickly change the narrative. Uh, because students can come in and, you know, sometimes between six weeks and two years, get a credential um, and be out making, you know, good money and doing well. So I, I think that higher ed, I think, is going to be increasingly dependent on community colleges to help us tell the story about the value of college in general. So, so much in what you just said there, you know, two things I would tell you that stand out. One, um, unfortunately, what ends up happening in many of these conversations um, nationally uh, is that we get into this ideological argument about mm -hmm. transactional versus transformational. <clears throat> I want to be very clear to all the watchers and listeners that by no means am I saying that we should increase our transactional nature as an institution, by no means. But there are pieces to the student experience that are truly transactional that need refinement, that have 
true barriers, the onboarding experiences, how information is obtained, how students are communicated to. Uh, the transformational piece, that being the student engagement, uh, that being the co-curricular, ex extracurricular, uh, the apprenticeships, the internships, uh, this then also being the transformation national piece towards the, the uh, attainment of the learning outcome, uh, right? That is not a transactional experience. It's very sacred uh, and it by no means should have transaction associated with it. It's towards Correct. the attainment of the outcome. And But having that proper balance. And for some reason, I find, Dr. Edwards, that uh, folks don't understand that, that that it's a whole pie to the whole um, that, that brings us to this space. Yes. The other thing I would say is, is that <clears throat> something that you said that struck a chord with me, is is the demographic shift that is happening across the country uh areas of of service where community colleges had a this is what we do in this space this is only what we do in this space we're geared towards transferability that meant something over the past 40 50 years but due to demographic shifts and economic pressures and industry disruptions you now have community colleges that are having to find their space yes. in places uh, and we go back to that word relevance. And then you've got four-year institutions that are having to delve into scope creep because they've got facilities and all these employees. And yet we still got to figure out the next 10 to 20 years, how do we find our space? Because right. we're experiencing, they are experiencing an overall reduction in enrollments, right? And so mm -hmm. now we've got scope creep and disruption happening within our space. Uh, and so everyone is having to find themselves on the dance floor. But uh, I think that that once we come uh, out of this era of disruption, uh, it is those that can truly find their self on the dance floor and their their level of relevance and what their outcomes, which means that their missions will be shifting yes. and the work will be shifting on what they're doing. But as long as we keep students the focus, economic and social mobility, the focus, I think that we can all win in this in this new realm. Yeah, I agree with you. The economics and social mobility piece, I think, is going to be a large part of the way out. Um, I think that, you know, it, it it's a win-win because it helps the students. I think it helps the institutions maintain their relevance. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that it can also create even more transformational experiences because you're figuring out, okay, if we want this person, you know, on the transactional side, we want them to have a credential, but we also want them to be productive in society when they finish. Um, you know, do we engage with the community to make sure that this experience is as good as it can be for the student. And some of that happens in the classroom and some of it happens outside of class. Um, and so, like you said, you gotta have the balance. I think that's that's critical. Um, I know a large part of what you do deals, you know, as a leader of this organization, uh, you, you don't get to just run it and just, you know, do what you do and stay on campus all day and, you know, <laughs> check email and, and do what you, I mean, you, you have to be out, right? You gotta, you, you have to engage folks, uh, particularly, you know, a lot at, at the legislative and, you know, regulatory level. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, some of the things that you have to do in that role and what's helped you be successful there? Yeah, you know, so some of the things I've had to do in this role as president, um, I've been blessed to be able to, to provide a congressional uh, testimony um, to, you uh, you know, at the highest levels of our of, uh, of uh, democracy and the representation in DC, I was very appreciative for that opportunity. Uh, here in the coming weeks, I'm going to be providing a presentation to um, uh, many um, senators and uh, congressmen that are coming here to Denver uh, for a state legislation meeting uh, regarding, again, the impact of community colleges as they move forward into the next realm. Also working with elected officials here locally, uh, that could be from city council to commissioners, uh, to our own Colorado state representatives and congressmen, uh, uh, men and women, uh, and, and really telling the story. And what does that mean? Telling the story of uh, who we are, what we do, and where we need their, their support. Uh, really telling that story with industry about what we've done, but what we're committed to doing moving forward. And because of all the disruptions that are happening in industry, you now have industry running to the tables, back to higher education and saying, how can we re-envision our relationships, our partnerships? Mm -hmm. How can we be a part of the shift in curriculum and the outcomes? How can we create exclusive uh, workforce pipelines from the academic pipeline? And so it is very, very uh, exciting times. But what I would say also is for this new age leader, uh, those that desire to serve at the president level, what does this mean for me? This means that 
Um, you need to be very intentional about the spaces in which you seek to serve. Uh, and really ensure that there's a fit and an alignment with who you are as an individual, uh, what you're able to provide, uh, and what you're not able to provide. Uh, because as these institutions are coming out and saying, we want to see this, we want to see that, really asking yourself, am I the person for this? Not just chasing the title, mm -hmm. not just chasing the opportunity. It really, you have to bring benefit. And when I saw the presidential call for Community College of Aurora, uh, and saw its untapped potentials. I just saw the opportunity for me to get in that space, tell the story, build relationships, uh, and to tell it all the way from DC to uh, Aurora, Colorado, what we're doing uh, and, and where we see ourselves as being a part of the solution moving forward. Excellent. So you've had the opportunity to work in community colleges in both Colorado, Texas, uh, you know, in a variety of different roles. Uh, how are the community colleges similar in these two states and how are they different? Well, Texas, the Republic of Texas will <laughs> always be <laughs> the Republic of Texas. Uh, with that said, um, one thing I would first start with is the funding structure. Funding structures are different. Uh, here in the state of Colorado, we, we have what's called uh, the Taxpayers' Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. TABOR is what it's known as for short. Tabor in itself provides an entire different funding structure than what is done in the public institutions in the state of Texas through the Texas Education Coordinating Board. When I was there, it was called Texas 60 by 30. Uh, now I've been told it's in a new iteration uh, and with a new title and a new brand and, uh, you know, and that work is, is continuing. And so funding structure, I think, is key. Also understanding that in the community college space in the state of Texas, you have local taxation based on the districts. The state of Texas has 50 taxation districts, uh, very different than what is happening here in Colorado, the Community College of Aurora, why I would have, I would love to have local taxation as part <laughs> of our reality. It's just not, it's not a part of our reality. Um, so we also have a uh, full-time equivalency um, uh, funding model, different mm -hmm. than the headcount, the success, uh, the 10%, if it's still the same in the state of Texas, the 10%, um, infusion of the success points that also are incentivizing uh, the success uh, narratives of the institutions. So that's different. Uh, the other thing I would say, and while there are differences, there are similarities. Um, and so I think that the interactions between like, for instance, the Department of Higher Education here in the state of Colorado uh, has some of the similar functionalities uh, as the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, uh, minus a bit of that funding picture of uh, the regulatory uh, the vision of the service throughout the state, um, the coming together of uh, the programmatic needs or offerings of an institution and the needs of that community uh, still are, are very similar. And, and then, you know, the other similarities are the work, the work of educating, the work of empowerment, the work of opportunity remains the same in the spaces, yet depending space, there's a different need for relevance within that space. So some differences, some similarities, um, but uh, the work is still being done and in both spaces. And, you know, you talked a little bit about the funding structures and how they're different. I know you probably rely very he heavily on your CFO, but um, what are some of, like, if you're someone who's aspiring to this, you know, what are maybe a few things about finance a college president should know? Oh, yeah. Number one, know that one plus one equals two. Now, I say that comically, but I will tell you that for anyone uh, that, that is seeking to serve in these roles, number one, your moral compass and your level of integrity must be at an all-time high. Um, the, the responsibilities associated with this role, your integrity can never come into question. Uh, what you do and the decisions that you make it is imperative. Uh, that you are the living example of the mission in action, number one. Secondly, when it comes to the finances, be honest with what you know, be honest with what you don't know. Here's the things I would say definitely you need to know. You need to uh, associate yourself with the, the, the uh, structure of your funding sources uh, and structure at your respective state, whether that be the state of Texas, whether that be the state of Colorado, whether that be the state of New Mexico, you name it. 
You need to understand, is it local taxation? Uh, is it a uh, state appropriations model? Uh, you need to understand that, you know, grants and the, the grant structure um, and, and, and with the kind of grants that are feeding towards sustainability of the institution and its work, tuition and fees, understanding the various fees that are being passed on to students, the tuition structure, is it creating opportunity or is it creating barriers? Uh, having a, a deeper sense of also what has happened over time. What has happened over time? Has there been a reduction in state appropriations over time or an mm -hmm. increase? Um, has the percentages of the pie as a whole shifted over time? And where is it headed? Uh, this is also a part of that institutional fit in the respective state, states in which you serve. Uh, you need to kind of know, are you going to be the fundraiser in some spaces? Fundraising, as you think about facility needs, right now we're having our first capital campaign in 23 years here at the institution. Uh, the state provides a certain portion of that. Uh, it is not a bond state. So like Texas, where there are bonds that are passed that are del delving deeply into the facility needs. And next thing you know, you've got a 30, 40, $50 million building based on those bonds. Not part of our reality here in this space. Mm -hmm. We're having to fundraise those gap closures. Do you have the ability to be able to do that? Do you know how, how to go about doing that? So that's key and critical. The second part of that I would also say is that understand that budget to actualization is a real thing. It is not just a concept. You need to understand your budget to actualization and be able to track that uh, and know what does that mean to be able to track uh, the volume and flow, uh, not just quarterly, uh, weekly. Uh, understanding where institutions can truly get themselves in trouble. Uh, also understanding how projections take place. That's the third part of this. Understanding the projection model at your respective institutions that delve deeply into the enrollment management funnel, not just the front end, but persistence, completion, the mm. continuance of that student through the cycle. If you're not careful, you'll find uh, this goes into another point, losses. Uh, and, and in some spaces, from an industrial standpoint in industry, they call it shrink. You've got to know where your shrink is located. You've got to understand where there's a duplicacy of programs that are causing inefficiencies. It is critical to find where there is loss. You have to be a good student, a stu steward, student and steward, but a good student of taxpayer funds uh, and resources and being able to give an account for your vision as a president and how those resources are being utilized in the advancement of the mission, ultimately to the attainment of the vision. And so all of that is a part of that picture of when it comes to financing and resourcing. So you mentioned a key word there and uh, this vision. So yeah. when I think about vision and, and strategy, you know, I think of strategic plans for an institution. Um, how, how do you think that works uh, you know, well on a campus and how do you keep your campus focused on, you know, the mission and, and the strategic direction that you're trying to go? Every day, every day. I would say that anyone that's serving, that's seeking to serve at this level or at any executive level or any level, it is important that everyone on your team knows the mission. Why? Because they have to find themselves in the mission. If you're not careful and there's no sense of what the institutional mission is, we then go on the chase of good ideas. And good ideas can send you in the wrong direction, especially when there is no strategic objective alignment. Uh, and I think that this goes back to strategy one on one. The mission then drives the objectives. The objectives are then fed by goals. Those goals are then had accountable every day by day to day operations that are held accountable through key performance indicators and metrics. And so as we think about strategic planning one on one, uh, it is then imperative that the institution truly delve uh, into the understanding of its mission and ultimately its vision to then know what do I do every day to advance this work. And where there is a misalignment in understanding, there will be a misalignment in operation. Mm. So based on that, uh, as, as a leader, you have to, in achieving that vision, also have to engage both your board and external stakeholders, whether those are community leaders or employers. Um, how do you keep them on board? How do you engage them well? You know, and that's another uh, uh, difference I will tell you in structure that I would tell anyone aspiring uh, in these roles to understand the difference in um, governance structure. So here in the state of Colorado, I work for an amazing, amazing chancellor, uh, Joe Garcia, who's the former uh, 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 Lieutenant Governor of the state of Colorado and a former two-time uh, college university president himself. Uh, and so I report to Chancellor Joe Garcia, who then reports 
uh, to the State Board of Community Colleges and Occupational Education. So here in the state of Colorado, my interaction with the board is twofold. One, um, uh, at the board meetings themselves, we have interactions and representation uh, to the state board through the chancellor on the given agenda to speak directly to what's happening here at CCA. And then there is what has to be approved by the state board through uh, uh, the uh, recommendations of the chancellor uh, to be able to do this work. Second fold of that in terms of my board interaction would be here in the state of Colorado, every college, and there's 13 community colleges here, has a board representative. Mm. Uh, so my board representative and I uh, uh, then have interactions through uh, our chancellor on what is happening in this particular community uh, and able to speak directly to our needs and serve as a representation on the state board directly for the work that we're doing uh, and where we need resourcing and support. Very different than a, in a structure, a governance structure where you will have a state president, excuse me, state pre a college president who is then reporting to a board. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we get into another uh, pivot uh, in the role where there can be either a locally elected board or a state appointed governor appointed board. It's just so happens here in the state of Colorado, it is governor appointed. Okay. Uh, very different than the Alamo colleges where I most recently served where their board uh, in San Antonio is locally elected. And all of those you know, differences in governance also have an impact as well. Right. Also looking at the differences in terms uh, and how long a term, a given term. One board I served with uh, under their governance they had six-year terms. That's a pretty significant amount of time in comparison to, to some uh, governance boards where they may have a three-year term and what can happen in a given point in time. So um, that's what I would say. So that, that hopefully that answers your question. Dr. It does. It does. Uh, one thing we didn't really talk about so much was instruction. Um, mm. So I know a lot of you know, community college leaders uh, maybe come from student affairs or other parts. Of it. So what do they need to know about instruction? Mm. What I would say is, is understanding um, the power of the, the science of teaching. Um, under, understanding what does that transformation look like? What does that experience look like? What does it look like? What all goes into the development of a curriculum? Uh, what goes into the establishment of outcomes? What goes into the academic um, instructional materials? And how do we create these learning spaces that are transformational? Truly understanding it. And I would also say that once you understand that, then also delve into, as I say, the business of higher education, understanding how those courses are then scheduled, understanding how those uh, degree pathways and certificate pathways are created and developed uh, and understanding what goes into a course load, uh, what goes into um, these synergies that are created by the offering of those various courses at given times to create additional synergies and pathways towards understanding and completions and how does that happen? What happens in that space? I would also say it's also critical to understand accreditation. Mm. Uh, because accreditation is critical uh, in understanding the academic instructional piece. Uh, and I think that from there, it then better prepares our student affairs professionals uh, and the like to then understand how do I add value in the instructional space? And then how do I create learning outcomes in my student experiences mm. that then feed into the synergies that are happening in the classroom, these co-curricular experiences? Uh, and I think that all that combined makes for a well-prepared educator. Nice, nice. In, in terms of your work, because I, I mean, you are a very, uh, I think, business-minded leader, uh, do you have maybe a, a dashboard or something that you look at and, you know, you, when you come in in the morning or you, you know, leaving for the week and trying to see, you know, are, are we, is, are there certain metrics that you're just like, okay, you know, these are the, the five that I, I look at to make sure we're, we're moving where we need to move. You know, I'll give you three because my dashboard, uh, it gets into some, some of the weeds to be quite honest with you, okay. just because of where we are. As but you're a dashboard guy, I can tell. Yeah, I'm a dashboard guy. <laughs> I am a dashboard guy. Like, yeah, I got to know how fast we're moving. I've got to know how many RPMs. Now, I do need to know if we're about to run out of gas. Yeah. Uh, so I got to pay attention. That engine sounds a little too happy, and we need, we need to find a gas station. So yes, we sir. need to slow this down a little bit. 
Um, with that said, enrollment, right? Enrollment dashboards is something that's critical, not just so much the head count in FTE, but understanding what is the volume moving into the classroom, that the experience. It's just one. Uh, the second dashboard I will talk about then is will be our equitable, and I, the reason I say equitable is key to, to call this out, equitable student success. Not just the overall success, but who we as an institution have identified in the various intersects of those identities that we've called out that we need to ensure that those those communities are experiencing success uh, within their their community as a whole, I think is critical. And the third, I would also say uh, is finance. We have to understand where we're experiencing losses and attempting to do this work so we can mitigate those losses and be able to make reinvestments back into the institution to improve the equitable student success and ultimately then the enrollment of the institution. Awesome, awesome. So we've talked about a lot of different topics. Are there, is there anything that you'd like to leave us with that we haven't already discussed? Oh man, these have been some good questions, man. Um, I would say to anyone who truly has aspirations to serve at this level, we need you. We need good, solid educators to take us into this next era of higher education and society. Um, and I would say that make sure that you keep your health, the focus, uh, your health, uh, your physical health, your mental health, um, the focus, family, keep your family, your family structure, whatever that may be, the focus. Uh, we shouldn't lose you uh educator in doing this work and nor should your family lose you uh, as well in doing this work uh, I, i've said this uh I, I frequently say this and i'll say it in, in this on this platform as well um is that what good is it to be this astounding educator in your institution of service yet you're not a outstanding father mother brother sister family member um and so a transformation begins at home uh and so begin that work and do that work yeah, so you can be the best for them that so you can be the best for us in this work of educating. Uh, and, and the last thing I would say is remain integritous. We need good integritous leaders uh, that are not selfish, that understand the charge, um, that understand the significance, that in many cases, we only get one opportunity to get this right. This should not say, mean that we should be risk at, at, at uh, averse. Uh, there are risks in the spirit of innovation, but what should not be at risk is your integrity, your moral compass, um, and being sure to follow in line with the regulations that have been put forth for the work that you do. Man, that is a good way to close it out. So thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate you again for doing this. Uh, thank you everybody who's tuned in today. It's been another edition of our Charlton Online Community College Leadership Series. And uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Brownlee. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you.